Good morning and welcome back to the Isle of Faces, Scraps and Scrolls slash Valor Aridus, Clash of Kings number one. Hello, welcome back. Yes, we're here for the start of a new book. Very exciting. You join me on the Isle of Faces, as I said, and also in very sunny England. Sunny for a day. I think we're getting a Hurricane Lorenzo tomorrow, so that's nice. I am Sir Buckley. I'm a bit battered and bruised from a, a basketball game, but so you guys might have to drag me through this one, but I'm sure I can rely on you. So, like I say, today we start a new book, Clash itself. Very exciting. Before we get to that, let me uh, just remind you all that this week we've got our first Patreon only episode coming out, and it is a bit of a recounting from myself and Lady Buckley, whom I know you will prefer to me, don't deny it. We're counting our recent trip to Belfast, where we went on the Game of Thrones trip and went around all the filming locations. You might have seen some of our pictures on on Twitter and uh, some other stuff too, the Titanic Museum and such like that. So like I say, that'll be for patrons only. It's our first patron only episode, the first of many. And also just to remind you that we've adjusted our tier system a little bit. So now any patron of ours gets access to patron only content so if you're interested in uh, in that trip to belfast or in just hearing lady buckley's sweet sweet voice compared to this thing that i'm using pop over to our patron and uh, for one dollar a month or more you can have a listen but that's that out of the way let's talk about clash of kings now i didn't get to uh, i wasn't part of this project when aziz and share started game of thrones so this is good being in from the start being on from being in from the ground level so let me talk just a little bit about Clash of Kings as a whole before we get started. As a reminder, today we're doing three chapters, as you'll know from having listened to Sunday's live stream of Aziz and the Share. It's the prologue, obviously, with Maester Crescent. It's Aya 1 and it's Sansa 1. And I don't even have that many notes for Aya 1, so we might be in for uh, a short one today, but... Then again, we have got that massive Crescent chapter. But before we get to those, so Clash of Kings. I think on my first read, Clash of Kings was probably my second least favourite. I didn't look on it uh, favourably. And that first reread, that first read rather, was years and years ago now. And I really struggled to remember why. I didn't like it, to be honest, because on reread, I love it. I love Clash. Especially the focus on the Riverlands and the Wall of Five Kings as that progresses and seeing it through both Aya's perspective on the ground floor, on the the battlefield, and through Catelyn's POV of the decisions both of Rob and then her interacting with Renly and Stannis, she gets to see the most of these uh, Five Kings. I think my favourite POV for the book is Catelyn, easy, because she's my favourite POV always, but in this book as well. Just like Game of Thrones, she gets to go here, there and everywhere and meet everyone and we see the most stuff through her eyes. We see Rob, we see Renly, we see Stannis, we see magic um, and we see the defence of Riverrun and the Riverlands as well through Edmure, etc. Also on top of that, also we can't ignore Tyrion's POV of the, the most chapters and his politicking in King's Landing. I think everybody enjoys that. It's, it's very hard not to. Hard on that. John's storyline, just uh, the end of John's storyline, I really enjoy the beginning, going through Craster's Keep, etc. A bit slow for me, but once we get involved with uh, Corrin and and his really cool little crew, I really enjoy that trip up into the Frost Fangs, etc. That's cool. What else have we got? Bran. I've never really enjoyed Bran's chapters, if I'm holding my hands up and being completely honest, and I probably enjoy his Clash chapters the least. For whatever reason just doesn't sit quite well with me there's a lot of stuff in there uh, as we're going to find out but well, i don't know they're just a bit slow and um not as good as his game of thrones chapters especially even though to be fair when he starts interacting with fion that gets more interesting and speaking of fion if that isn't uh one of the best kind of mini contained storylines in one book fion's fall from grace if it's not amazing to read and also that his chapter coming up where he mistakes uh Esgred, or mistakes asher for Esgred, rather if that isn't the funniest chapter to read on reread when you know the ending and all the signs from wex and um all, all the stuff that asher says that might be my favorite chapter of the whole book we'll get there but uh it is 
Bloody brilliant. Uh, who else have we got? Daenerys. That's a pretty rough POV for this book, if uh, I do have to say. If we didn't have the House of the Undying at the end, ooh, it just kind of circles, doesn't it? I think the beginning in the Vase Deloro might be the best stuff. I'm not a big fan of the calf storyline, as I know many others aren't. Yeah, just kind of nothing, nothing much happens, really. Which is a shame, because the big build-up she got up at the end of Game of Thrones where she took over from Ned as kind of the focus point and having the most chapters at the end and obviously the ending of the dragons coming alive and it seems to sputter out a little bit and I know a large part of that is she needs to be doing something while all this other stuff is happening in Westeros but uh, yeah not not a highlight of the book overall though uh, we won't go through every POV because we're going to be doing enough of that overall love Clash of Kings love it on reread being really thrown into the um, into the war itself, I think, is its highlight. Because by Storm of Swords, a lot of it has calmed down. And obviously, it unofficially ends in the Storm of Swords. So this is the real nitty-gritty, the real arguing book about what makes a good king and all these different approaches. And we really, really see Rob in his element and then out of it again a bit later. There you go. Great book, I'm uh, very excited to go through it. So I guess we should start. And the first chapter is, of course, our prologue with Maester Crescent and on Dragonstone. Lots of good settings in this book, even more so than Game of Thrones. So this, as I think you'll probably see from uh, Aziz in the Shares talk on Sunday, this is a big, big old chapter. There's a lot to pack through. So I'm don't worry, I'm not going to attempt the range that Aziz did because you can talk about everything in this chapter there's so much there's the war effort itself that's probably the simplest bit just the Stannis gathering his swords there's Cressen himself there's Shireen we get Melisandre introduced we get magic pretty much introduced uh, in terms of southern Westeros we get um, Davos <laughs> major chapter and uh, the memories of the Baratheon boys is young young men and how what they've become there's you could go on for hours and hours and hours so i won't do that i will just try to uh keep it a little more compact so this chapter for me is the biggest thing to take away from it it's the merge of magic and state mer merge of magic and politics for the first time and that's the, the two biggest strengths of a song of fire and fire isn't it is the eerie magic stuff of the wall and the others and uh the dragons mixed with all the political stuff of Tyrion and King's Landing and Ned and the war, etc, etc. And here they are, butting heads for the first time. So far in Game of Thrones, all the magic is kept very much to the prologue, really. The prologue in the last chapter. Uh, and it's above the wall or it's off in Essos. It's got nothing to do with this war until now. Now it's starting to get mixed in through Melisandre, which uh, Cresson obviously realises and is, is not happy about. He he's the secular figure. He's the one trying to brush off magic and be like, no, that's not part of it. Much like we know the Maesters. I mean, that that is the Maester line, isn't it? The party line. We know the Citadel doesn't like magic and may have even taken steps to get rid of it. So they've obviously ingrained that in their students. We know that from Game of Thrones, where Lewin was the the secular figure. Whenever Bran brought up his dreams, etc., Lewin was the one trying to tie everyone back to reality and and what it was really like. But Lewin, at the very end of Game of Thrones, he was proven wrong because, uh, even if he couldn't admit, because Bran and Rickon, they shared the same dream before Ned came along. And here we are with Cresson. He is going to be proven wrong at the end of this chapter also. And uh, unfortunately, that's the same path that Lewin will follow. We start this book with a maester dying because he goes up against magic. And Lewin, he also finishes off the book dying. Now, to be fair, he doesn't go up against Magic is just the, the Ironborn, but uh, not a good book for maesters, obviously, unfortunately. So like I say, that, that merge of magic and state, that's really... It's one of the biggest chapters for it, one of the biggest books for it as, as well. Probably more so... We have more magic, I'm trying to think, influencing the politics and the war via Renly's death than we do in any of the other books. Now, you can argue in Storm of Swords that Stannis's sacrificing of leeches affects things more but we don't we don't know that's just the Melisandre line that that's actually killing off Balon and Robin and Joffrey in this book there's no amb ambiguity 
shadow assassins kill Renly and completely change the war. So there's no arguing there that this this is the big merge and this chapter is laying that out for us right from the get-go. So like we said, Crescent has these worries about uh, magic and Melisandre and he starts off looking at the comet and thinking of the future and he actually like chides himself for think, even entertaining the idea. He's got to remind himself, I, I'm a man of the Citadel. I, I deal with facts and figures, not comets and chanting and uh, nights full of terror or anything like that. I'm not anything to do that. But what we discover is it, it's not that he's just against that because that's what he's been taught by the Citadel and that's his life's work. He is playing the father role for Stannis. That's what he's really worried about. If a comet means the birth of dragons halfway across the world, that's one thing for Cressin. The thing that bothers him is it's here on his doorstep and with someone who he basically considers a son. Crescent thinks of Stannis as a son. That's one of the more tragic sides of this chapter. It's a, He's basically a dad trying to save his son. He's a he's kind of a conservative dad who's worried that his, his son has come home with a girl you know, covered in tattoos and a motorbike and it's going to lead him down dark and dangerous paths, which, um, to be fair, Melisandre kind of does, so he's not completely wrong. And it's these, it's this personal factor mired in the politics and magic that that mark A Song of Ice and Fire for what it is. We've discussed back in Tyrion's Green Fork chapter. What makes that chapter so interesting is not just the description, as as brilliant as it is, of the battle and what's going on. It's that Tyrion has a personal factor in that battle, and he's trying to work out if Tywin is trying to kill him or not. Crescent could just describe Melisandre. Uh, Melisandre's influence and how it might affect Stannis but it matters more to us as a reader because Crescent is concerned for Stannis himself he has that personal link he's not just a maester you know, if this was Maester Pylos's POV I'm sure he might be worried about Stannis as well but he's obviously not got the same personal connection that Crescent does so that's what makes the chapter let's talk very quickly about our setting in this chapter Dragonstone and it's a shame about Dragonstone because I love Dragonstone and in this book, I think, if I'm right, we just get this chapter, Davos's first chapter, and then I'm pretty sure Davos 2 is uh, off in Storm's End. I think I'm right in saying that. So just two chapters, maybe three. Maybe, maybe I'm misremembering Davos 2, but I think I'm right. Only two chapters in Dragonstone, and then in Storm of Swords we get a few more, but and, and then we're gone again. We don't get nearly enough Dragonstone for my liking, and um, for those of you who are aware of my Castles book, Yes, I, I do very much enjoy Dragonstone, and so you'll hopefully see one day when, once I finished it. So I think it's very very fitting that Dragonstone is the is the setting for this merge of man- magic and politics because that is what it was six hundred years ago when the Targaryens set it up. There was okay, there had been magic previously, obviously in um, in Westeros, but by that point that was all gone and forgotten. The children were gone, and the Andals had come, etc., etc., and then. This island pops up with a castle that they, the Westerosi couldn't understand and they couldn't replicate. Dragons were flying all around it. So that's the same kind of merging. It's magic being inserted into uh, the political real world. But more than that, it's if we think about the actual architecture of Dragonstone and it's uh, twisted stone and uh, it's made into, you know, it's got the, the kitchens... Uh, made into a dragon and every tower looks like a dragon to say nothing of all the different uh, things on the merlons the basilisks and and of course dragons and more so so if we look at game of thrones the ending of game of thrones the last chapter we had is about stone dragons stone eggs hatching and becoming real and influencing the world the very next chapter we get is set in a place full of stone dragons and it's even called dragon stone so it's quite heavy with the link here aren't we that hey guys these stone dragons just hatched so just remember that things of stone and that have been forgotten can come back here we are on this island called dragon stone and remember at this point dragon stone is kind of like a forgotten place it's not the grand royal birthplace that it was in the early reign of the Targaryens where they get all their dragons from it's just this kind of shitty little island out in the sea that no one likes not even its own lord wants it in Stannis we've got to remember that powerful things can come from that we know Stannis is crowned here he begins his reign if you want to call it that 
and Daenerys was born here. So her journey, her influence on the world can be traced right back to Dragonstone. So I think that's what we got to look at, that Dragonstone is made of stone, but stone some kind, sometimes comes alive. And speaking of Dragonstone, very quickly let's talk about Robert and Stannis disliking having Dragonstone. I've always liked the idea that Robert gave Stannis Dragonstone with the intent for it to be well received. And there's been an argument beforehand, but I think George did clear it up at one point that Robert was actually trying to be nice to Stannis and saying he was Prince of Dragonstone unofficially in the air, etc. But it's just, it's so very Robert, isn't it? Trying, or at least kind of trying to do the right thing and then getting mispresented and ending up being a wrong thing. That's quite a good little microcosm for Robert's reign overall, I think. Let's talk about the man himself, Stannis. We get introduction to one of the biggest characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, and we talked a lot in get during Game of Thrones about that vacuum of Stannis not being there. So that's finally filled. We finally see what we've been missing. And I think on on the first read, you don't even realise that. I think we've spoken about this before. Realise how big that vacuum is but definitely on reread you oh stannis is here yeah now we know now we know and uh just to set the tone for stannis a lot of his dialogue in this chapter is complaining not on julie he's in a bit of a rubbish situation but it sets the tone for him as a person who focuses on his slights and what's been done before and right from the off Crescent tries his best to get Stannis to forget those slights and focus on the bigger picture he wants him to make alliance with Rob or or Renly or anyone basically just don't do this alone he's begging and okay that doesn't work Crescent fails in this instance but the message does eventually get through as Stannis's arc continues and the war against the others becomes his focus he does start looking at the bigger picture he does forget his slights uh, well, forget, maybe not, but he at least shifts the focus. He does go to the wall. He abandons the Iron Throne for now. Now, now we do know, okay, that is his ultimate goal, but he is also looking at the bigger picture. So Crescent failed, but he might have set the seeds that Stannis thought about later. We did get some information on the Siege of Storm's End in Game of Thrones, but we get a lot more about it here. It's a big made a big deal of before we actually get to Stannis and it shows his relationship with Davos and their finger chopping, etc. etc. So we're really setting up Stannis before we even get to the room with him. It shows uh, he is the man willing to do the nitty gritty, that he's uh, obsessed with justice and fair play and all of that. So re- we're getting all the Stannis themes chucked at us in this one chapter. There's a reason this chapter is so long. We've got a lot to fit in. Stannis is a big character. We need to give him his due. And uh, George does that. Now, talking about just his position in the war, like I say, Stannis is kind of a, in a shoddy situation. Most of his Stormlords, or pretty much all the Stormlords, are with Renly, and as well as the uh, Reach Lords. So Renly's got a much bigger army than him. So does Tywin, so does Rob, and... Stannis is stuck out to sea with not you know, Lord Celtigar, Lord Valerian, and uh, Lord Sunglass, and not really names to be writing home about at this period of history. And okay, he's got some Lysini cell swords or cell cell sails, which is hard to say, but not a great situation. Doesn't look good for him in the war right from the off. But then again. I think what George is trying to tell us here, hey, remember not so long ago in the Game of Thrones when Rob was first coming down from the north? Didn't look too good for him either. Tywin had all the advantages, he had the numbers, and then bing, bang, bosh, Rob does this, Rob does that, River runs saved, uh, Tywin, sorry, looks much worse, and he's in a bad situation, and then we know that gets changed around by the end of the book. So George... Obviously, in these early chapters, has to set up what kind of situation each king is in. And basically, none of them are in that same situation at the end, really, are they? So George is reminding us, don't put too much stock in these uh, early situations. Uh, Crescent's thinking of Stannis obviously relates, uh, points in towards Renly, because these two boys that he's really had a hand in raising, they are gone from fighting as boys to fighting as kings in a war. And Crescent is kind of pretty damning of Renly's character, really, as a as a person and a king. And that's really... It's not our first hint. We do get a good look at Renly in Game of Thrones, but it's the first 
clue that Renly is more obsessed with his not just physical appearance but kind of the optics of stuff and he's more the well he's the opposite of Stannis let's say that he's the um he's not well think of Donald Noy's words really that's what that's what we're trying to say here now speaking about that that idea of Crescens to ally with the North the veil it's a real shame that Solice comes in at the wrong time because Stannis was actually kind of oh, well, maybe I will listen to this then Solice comes in and says uh, like basically triggers Stannis's ego a bit and makes him go the opposite direction which is a shame because that would have really balanced the scales in terms of what the other kings control and the numbers but then again not really because we know a lot more about Lysa so that wouldn't have she wouldn't have entered for Stannis either for, or for anyone else but if only Stannis and Robert got together thinking about their relationship with Ned as well eh, alas alarm Okay, to finish off this chapter then, uh, like I say, I think as he's got to more more than enough notes for us all. But we do have some extra characters in this chapter. We get the wonderful Patchface in his creepy songs. And I like to think of Patchface as an odd mirror to Melisandre himself. Because Melisandre is here advocating uh, getting into bed with these otherworldly powers and gods and uh, what magic and gods and devoutness can get you. And Patchface is maybe, maybe, big maybe, what the actual end result of getting into bed with these powers can be. It's the sword without a hilt argument, isn't it? It's not It's not Harry Potter magic, isn't this helpful, easy to understand, easy to wield thing? And even if, if Melisandre is pushing it as religion rather than straight up magic, it's pretty much the same thing for us. So, uh, and it is dangerous as we see. It is real dangerous and people do come off the worst for getting involved in it and Patchface is maybe a warning about that and uh, a bit of a antonym to Melisandre. And also we have Shireen. I won't go on about Shireen because uh, we'll get too sad. But I did, I did completely forget that she has dreams of dragons coming to eat her and I wonder if she's dreaming of dragons coming to eat her or is it fire specifically? The dragons represent fire in her dreams. Or perhaps her burning, her assumed burning, will be of some use, something to do with Targaryens or just further bringing magic back into the world. I don't know. I don't want to think about it. Let's move on. So that final point for Maester Crescent, and before we leave Dragonstone for a while, and unfortunately Maester Crescent forever, he is the most important prologue character in terms of just straight up, let's line these prologue characters up. Who is the most important person will is just a random a member of the night's watch uh chet also pate is a was he a novice acolyte i can't remember nothing nothing important and varamir okay he's kind of a, a leader in an army but not too much crescent is the most important we have He's the one whose backstory is actually tied to important characters. He lives at these big places. All the other POVs, prologue POVs anyway, they are out in a forest. They're out in the wild. They're, okay, Old Town is pretty nice, but it's not like Pate is in the um, the important parts of the Citadel or anything, is it? He's in a pub. Crescent is in Dragonstone, one of the great castles. He's with a king. He's with Davos, another POV. He's with Melisandre, a major character. This is the most important prologue chapter we get. It's the biggest introduction to new storylines. It's the most other prologue POVs. And it's the most, the biggest influence on important characters and important players in the Game of Thrones. We do not get that in the other in the other prologue POVs, not at all. So that's, it's a, this one's really an outlier and it's a great chapter. But let's move on to the book itself. We can't spend all day on Dragonstone as much as we might like to. We have to get on with our regular POVs. And the first one we get to return to is Aya. So this is I 1. Now I will say, as much as I really love Aya's POV in this book, it is brutal to read. It's really tough. Probably worse than you remember if we go back and you actually look at all the details of things that... I either sees or just overhears. I think probably that overhearing is the worst. We always know that imagining stuff is is worse. Oh, it's, it's a rough storyline. But these first chapters, they, they take a little while to get going just because there's 
stuff to, to fit in, I guess. But I didn't actually have that many notes for this, so this will be a, a quick little segment here. And some of my notes, as he's got to anyway, about um, kind of Aya's place in the within the other POVs and and uh, learning about Yoren knowing Eddard was supposed to take the black. So I think as he's also mentioned this, but I'll, I'll go a bit further into it, is Yoren's talking to Aya after she beats up Hot Pie, which is quite a fun scene. It reminds me very heavily of Donald Noy and Jon Snow early in Game of Thrones and that, that mentorship role and kind of getting over your your privilege type thing and realise why people are fighting you. It's probably not for the reason you think type thing. And we only get Yoren for how many... When does he kick it? Is it IF3? It's a bit further than that. But we don't get it for long, do we, considering the amount of IF chapters we have in Clash. Uh, we don't have him long and it's just it makes me wonder what could have happened... To I, if she just had a bit more of that mentorship role, because he's probably the most stable of the Aya mentors she has. Well, no, Syria was stable too, but um, so it would have been very interesting if they had been able to go a little bit longer. Of course, not an option for her. But yeah, a lot of very, very similar to Donald Noy and Jon Snow. And I, I think as he said, how much Aya mirrors Jon Snow anyway, so that's not a surprise. Talking about Lomi and Hot Buy, they are the enemy here for this chapter and I has just come out of King's Landing all that trouble having her stuff stolen and the threat of violence sexual violence and everything else so she's obviously thinking oh I've escaped that and then she comes face to face with more bullies now looking back if I uh, if we think about Storm of Swords Aya when she looks back she's not going to think of Lomi and Hot Pie as, as enemies. She's going to think of them probably as stupid little boys because that's what they are. And she's going to realise, well, I was annoyed at them. I was scared of them when I've been through Craigork again and the Tickler and Wheeze and Chiswick and everyone else in this. In, that she's going to encounter in this book. And obviously by that point, she's actually friends with Hot Pie and she even she didn't think kindly of Lomi, but she did kind of make a little alliance with him for a little while before he he dies. So it's a bit of set up here from George saying, uh, like, look, this this is the enemies of childhood and you're about to really grow up and realise what enemies and evil are. These kids aren't evil or enemies. They're just starving kids who haven't got much in the world. So that, that's a big learning curve for Aya there. But I think why she kicks off about, and kicking is the uh, the focus here, why she kicks off about Hot Pie, he is lying about kicking men to death via the crotch uh, is because she's just actually experienced death she's just seen ned get beheaded like i don't know what the time scale is but it's not long ago and more importantly she's just experienced she's just experienced murder herself she stabbed the stable boy she's killed someone we know she carries a lot of guilt about that she really really worries about it so to hear someone blatantly lie about killing someone it really rubs her up the wrong way because they, they don't know what it's actually like. They're seeing it as a joke, as a boast, and it's really eating her away at this point. So she snaps and shows him what for, basically. She knows the real weight of murder and death. She's just experienced her own household dying. She knows Sir well, she thinks Sirio's just died, and she knows Ned, obviously. She doesn't need little boys making up inane stories. She knows the reality, so she's going to teach him some of it. And uh, like, I'm generally going to leave Aya 1 there because it's a short chapter that you don't... It's mainly set up, and I think, as he's got to everything on Sunday. So I won't, won't try and repeat anything. We'll just move on to our next chapter, Sansa 1. Uh, if you remember, this is Joffrey's birthday and the kind of rubbish little tawny, and we get Tyrion coming back and everything like that. So there's a lot more in this chapter. And um, we get it... The One of the earliest things we get in this chapter is the fact that Sansa is still being beaten she's still a prisoner obviously and not a well looked after one and um and we actually open up the chapter with sansa meeting up with sir aris i never know how whoever it is aries but just spelled it in the if it's aris i think of it as aris actually so i'll just keep with that with sir aris oakheart and um he was obviously mentioned in Game of Thrones, but we don't, we get a bit more of him here, and we'll get a lot more of him later. But basically, the the first message we get is Sansa is being ill treated, and unfortunately, Sir Aerys, 
he's part of that. He, we want to say well done to him for speaking up. He at least protests and says, I, don't, I really don't want to hit this teenage girl. But he does hit the teenage girl, or preteen girl, isn't she, basically. Uh, yes, yeah, he still hits the defenseless little girl. So really, is he any different from the rest? Is he? Do we applaud him for not wanting to hit the teenage girl? Or do we chastise him because he does hit the teenage girl? I think it has to be the second option. I think we have to chastise him. It doesn't really matter whether you are protesting or not. You still do it. And that's going to be a major argument throughout this book of ends justifying means and does it matter your intentions depending on the outcomes. And we get that right here because... Cerveris is a bit of a dick, unfortunately. Soiled knight indeed. We get we've talked before about Kevin Lannister. He validates Tywin by his actions. And in the same way, Sir Ares here, he validates Joffrey. You need people to kind of go along with you and do your carry out your orders to make them uh real. Now, okay, you can argue what's his choice here, because if he disobeys, that's probably it for Sir Ares. But then shouldn't that okay shouldn't you be taking that on board when you swear the oaths of knighthood that if you don't uphold them it means your end possibly that's kind of the point isn't it that you're giving your life to uh this higher calling and uh, defending of innocence etc etc he's kind of like a, a weaker form of barristan we know from barry's past that he stood by and watched and that gave credit to king Ares, the mad king because Tywin makes a lot of point about the nobility and fame of someone like Sir Barristan lending credit and that they needed him on side because if you see uh, Sir Barristan, for example, standing by and serving King Ares, then as a small folk or as a, as a looker-on, you think, well, he can't be that bad because Sir Barry's there and he, he seems to be quite happy in his service. Same thing here on a much smaller scale. You see Sir Ares, you think, oh, he's quite, he's a, uh, he's a knight, he's a knight of the King's Guard. He, so if he's serving Joffrey, Joffrey can't be all that bad. And although we, it's very obvious the closer you get to Joffrey, that is the optics of it to people a bit further away. So he's standing by and doing all this bad stuff. It really does have an, in, uh, an impact to the wider world and obviously to the teenage girl that he's smacking about. So it, it boils me up, boils me up. And it's hypocritical, especially compared to, we have also in this chapter, Sandor again, who is the opposite, basically, of Sir Ares. He's not the, um, I'm Mr. Chivalry, I'm Mr. Uphold My Vows. He's not even a knight, so there you go. But he's the one not doing beating Sir Ares is. And that's that's basically Sandor's case in a nutshell, isn't it? That doesn't matter what they swear, they still do bad things. I might do bad things, but at least I'm not pretending to... Um, pretending that I won't. Speaking of Sandor, it seems like Joffrey never asks Sandor to do any of the beating, and I wonder why that is. Is that because he knows deep down he'd be met with refusal? Joffrey does know Sandor pretty well, or like at least on some level. They spent a lot of time together. So does he know that they would come to uh, a disagreement? And does he know that a disagreement with Sandor might be quite tricky? Because if he turns around and says to Sir Ares, do this and they have a little bit of disagreement he knows at the end of the day Sir Ares will go along with him Sandor mm, bit different he is a bit more of a wild card and maybe on some level Joffrey does know that I don't know if Joffrey's intelligent enough to be aware of that but he may well be now on to the actual tourney itself let's throw up some air quotes tourney so think, let's think about Sansa's part in this because pre-beheading Sansa would have loved dressing up for a tourney and being part of the court. We know that because we saw it. We saw the uh, tournament in Ned's name and how much she loved it and being in King's Landing itself and part of the court and seeing all the people come out, etc, etc. That was her thing. It was her Woodstock. She loved it. But obviously now that girl is gone. She feels none of that excitement. She knows that there is just this thin layer of lies and bullshit on top of ev on top of everything basically she knows none of it's real and even if and even if that weren't the case uh this tawny is nothing in comparison to the old one anyway you think of all those knights that came from everywhere all over and all dressed in their splendor and it was out with the um 
small folk and there was well we remember the money poured into it we know all the food was out and it was as glorious as can be and now we get this thing which is just held in the red keep and it's got basically no one in it uh, i think as he said like even the winner of the last one is like i'm not play i'm not taking part of this this is rookie stuff and sandor he, d he does make fun of the participants because they are leaving much to be desired and sans is not there with jane paul laughing it up and whispering and thinking who's this who's that what's this um result here there's no sir loris to look at this time there's no there's nothing of interest she knows the truth of it now that all these people around her it's not the songs and that's really reminding us of basically what she went through at the end of the book obviously that's a big part of these opening chapters is reminding us of what the characters have been through recently and it's also uh, showing on how joffrey's rule is going already in these few short weeks or how it looks been even if no one is openly declaring that they don't like joffrey and they don't want to be around him they are smart enough not to be there there is basically none of the not only the turnout from across restaurants but across king's landing there's some of them there of course still but nothing like we saw before and no small no small folk either why because they are already pissed they already do not like this new regime and we don't want joffrey seeing that do we so let's keep him in the red keep now sansa she knows her best bet her best bet to avoid being beaten up is just go and notice don't speak or just speak uh when spoken to etc but she knows she knows that and she still speaks up for dontos so dontos when that all goes down with uh, Joffrey trying to have him killed. That's incredible bravery. She knows what that could cost her. I mean, that could, really, it could cost her her life. But it, at best, it might cost her some more beatings from Samarin or whoever. And she knows that, but she still speaks up for him. And it's a good job she does, firstly, because uh, if not, there goes her escape plan. Obviously, she's not to know this. And, you know, supposedly Littlefinger would have been able to come up with someone else to fill that role but it's harder than it sounds because this is obviously a, a bond of trust here and it gives Dontos a, a excusable reason to be helping Sansa that she helped him and also Sansa might not have stuck up for anyone rather than Dontos she might have even taken up Sandals offer to go with him at the Blackwater so we, a lot could have changed if Sansa doesn't get up for this and the quote actually goes that Sansa heard herself gasp no you can't now, Sansa hearing herself reminds me a lot of Tyrion saving Catelyn up on the high road. I, I don't have the quote to hand, but it's something like he was already moving. He moved before he realised. So it's that idea of people's inner goodness taking over, basically, in these times of stress. Sansa doesn't have time to think, well, if I say this, Joffrey's going to hit me. She just thinks, this guy's going to die. i got to say something. She says something. Same with Tyrion. He doesn't well he actually kind of does have time to think and he still just finds himself helping whether that's a good thing for his personal safety or not so it's it's just a good um a good indication that the good rises to the top no matter the situation sansa knows what will keep her safe and she goes against it anyway joffrey he kind of seems like he's bored with kingship already it's not as much fun as it should be he obviously remembers the tourney he had a tourney for his own name day uh, previously that we didn't see he knows about the tourney that um we saw on page and he can probably tell these are not quite this this one today is not of the same caliber and that uh, he's not getting what he wants he's not having the the love thrown on him that he thinks he deserves and also he thought that you know imagine his first day of kingship hey i get to behead ned on the steps of balor that's cool and what's he been able to do since then? It's just waiting around for Tywin to do something. So he's bored. So what's he going to do? He's going to start making his own fun. He's going to start making it with Dontos now. He's going to do it with Sansa later when he has a beating, beating in the um, in the throne room, because he's just a bored little kid who whose form of fun is beating other people or having them murdered. Yeah, good to think about, isn't it? Now, then we, at the end of the chapter, we have Tyrion arriving with his clansmen, who we, we all love and enjoy. And when they come in, they've been on the road, obviously, so Sansa, she notes them as shoddy and dusty, and the clansmen are big hairy men that were really ugly. It reminded me very much of Sansa uh, seeing Yoren for the first time, and at that point, she thought that looking bad was 
the equation to being bad. She sees Sir Loris, who looks very nice. She thinks he's very nice. She sees Joran, does not look very nice. She does not think he is very nice. That type of thing. And this is a great timing for her to see Tyrion, and who she also thinks of as ugly, and the the kind of beastly clansmen, because this is the same time that she's finding out that all the pretty ones uh, are kind of evil and useless. She's been thinking about Joffrey. She used to think he was beautiful, her beautiful prince, and she's realised now, oh, actually, him being beautiful doesn't exclude him from being evil. And so this is a really good time for her to look at Tyrion and think he's ugly, but not quickly think he's evil because she, he's kind of the best friend she will find among the Lannisters. Now, obviously, she doesn't go into that full hog because who can blame her? Lannisters kill her family, so she's not going to be uh, really trusting Tyrion, but definitely better than the rest. And that also ties in with Sandor. She finds Sandor as one of her better sources of comfort or just sources to rely on. And he is obviously not the... He's not a Sir Loras either. So it's all part of that lesson of Sansa learning what the songs actually meant. And lastly for this chapter, Tyrion's time with Tom and Marcella meeting them again. It's as great as it was in Game of Thrones. It's really a heartwarming moment. We don't get many Lannister family moments that are nice and uh, this is definitely one of them, the relationship between uncle and nephew and niece. Really funny back in Game of Thrones, really funny here. It's really nice, but unfortunately it's not really to last. This is pretty much it is the last time we see Tyrion act like that with his um, niece and nephew. Before long, it, he'll be thinking of them as pieces in the game because uh, he takes up his duties as Hand of the King and he's got to stop thinking of them as the fun little kids that love him he's got to start thinking of them as commodities and he ships Marcella off now some of that is to keep Marcella safe fair enough but he's also putting her to use there and then obviously when he starts arguing with Cersei and they really start tugging Tom and between one another then that kind of heartwarming picture we get here that's gone and even later much later in the series when Tyrion's in a much darker place he even thinks about pitting them against each other in, in war. So these memories of happy hugs and reunions, they are long gone by that point. But that is for another day. So just three chapters today. That's all wrapped up there for you in a nice little bow. Next time will be six chapters, as he surely mentioned that six chapters ago, this, this book round. Okay, so uh, yes, I hope you enjoyed that little intro to Clash of Kings. We will be back next week with six chapters as I said and that Patreon episode with me and Lady Buckley that will be up sometime this week so I encourage you to go and have a look at, pa at our Patreon and see if you fancy a look uh, especially if you want to listen to that trip about Belfast and the, the kind of strange things the tour guide said and uh, everything we found in a city still very much in love with Game of Thrones it has to be said thanks everybody and we will see you next time for Clash of Kings part 2 all the best